Hello everybody, welcome back for another episode of the Stokes Sound Podcast. I'm your host Ed Stokes and today we have the amazing Harley Eblen. Harley, how are you doing? I'm doing great, man. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Feel free to uh, introduce yourself, let our listeners know a little bit more about you. Yeah, my name is Harley. Uh, I'm a cellist and string arranger and we just met. I'm super excited to be talking. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I wanted to bring you onto the show because you are super talented at arranging strings, um, all of the stuff that I see on social media of you playing cello, um, you know, working with lots of different artists. And I kind of, I found it all really interesting and kind of how you kind of go about the process. So a lot of our audience are mixing engineers, producers. Mm. And one thing that I thought would be really good is to kind of get your knowledge and kind of let's go from the start really i mean what are you using in your setup to record strings and how do you go about it oh man i love the technical stuff so i'm actually you're hearing me through the microphone that i use for my cello i just swiveled it around for uh doing this recording it is a townsend lab sphere l22 modeling microphone um universal audio bought this company i think about two years ago or something i'm not keeping track but it is an unbelievably powerful modeling microphone. And we can get into why I love using that for recording strings. But I'm running that into an RME Babyface Pro interface. Got that going into my um, M1 MacBook Pro. And I'm running Studio One. Fantastic. So that's kind M1 of the MacBook Pro. <laughs> how, are you find, how are you finding the M1? Honestly, it's fantastic. Um, yeah. one of the one of the weird things I do in my process is I we can talk more about this too. I run instances of Melodyne live on just about everything. Um, and it's amazing to me when my computer can like handle like 20 live instances of Melodyne. Um, That's mad. Like in ARA running in the DAW. Like I've had a couple times where I push it to the limit and it just, it tells me to stop, which I understand I would too. But um, yeah, no, this thing is a beast. Amazing. Amazing. Do you know, I'm so glad you just mentioned that because this podcast is about string arranging, recording strings, uh, producing strings, mixing strings, and you've just touched upon Melodyne. And so does, that goes on to the point, are you tuning your strings? Yeah. Uh, that's honestly kind of my dirty secret. Um, <laughs> well, I, I let out a secret. <laughs> Yeah, we're, we're going to get get into that right off the bat. The, the primary reason I use Melodyne, I'm going to yeah. save myself a little bit here. Um, I love tracking everything panned left, right. So I'll double 90% of the tracks I record just to get width and allow um, the mixing engineer to kind of choose where things are spaced and to allow like usually the vocal guitar or whatever whatever the main elements are to sit in the center of the mix and allow the strings to kind of envelop it from the sides um i found that to be effective but the the easiest way i've found to accurately double parts is to load an instance of melodyne on the first part that i track and i sight read melodyne to track the second part um because like you've got the pitch, you've got like this, you've got the 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 slide. You can see yeah. all of that. You can see the blob width for intensity. So I can see the dynamics. I can see. I've learned to see my bow changes, um, and see different techniques that I use and how it looks on Melodyne. So I'll I'll be sight reading Melodyne. But then yeah, I I definitely I'll tune stuff. That is amazing. It's, it's about. <laughs> it's about the vibe of the take more than the intonation. If I can get the intonation right and the vibe is there, that's what I'm looking for. Do you know what? I'm so glad we went onto this topic because, as you said, it's a secret. But as a mixing engineer, it's actually my secret too. I I'm melodyne in everything. It could be horn parts, even guitars. And to actually know that the musician playing the string parts is happy doing it <laughs> themselves, it's like, yes, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I figure as long as what I'm delivering, it doesn't, If if I ever... I always A-B things. If I hear Melodyne on my cello, like if I can tell the difference, I, re I retrack it. Like yeah. period. There's no, there's no wiggle room on that rule for me. But like yeah. if it's transparent to the person playing it, like, come on. Does it matter? Does it, no. <laughs> does it really matter? <laughs> Fantastic. So if we just go back a little bit then to like to the recording side of it. So, yeah, you know, you're playing a cello. So how do you 
kind of go about that process? So let's say I'm an artist and I've come to you for um, some strings. Yeah. What, what, what is your approach within the production? Is you know, do you speak to uh, the producer of that track or are you producing the strings yourself? So it really, it's a case by case basis. I work with about equally right now, artists and producers. Sometimes they're self-producing. Sometimes the artist has worked with the producer and they've talked about needing strings and the artist will come to me. Sometimes it's a producer saying this track needs something kind of like what we were just talking about before we started this call. Um, it, it, so it really depends, but whoever comes to me, I usually try to get on a video call. Um, just to have a face to face conversation and really understand, like, what is this song? Like, talk about the writing process, talk about, like, really get inside of where they're coming from. Uh, because I found that, and I'm, I'm sure you've found this in your work as well, so much of the problems that arise in doing, like, overdub work, mixing work, anything, it, it's, it, it comes out of communication. Um, yeah, so I, 100%. yeah, so I, I try to really sit down and have whatever conversation we need to have around that, like take care of people's uncertainty and issues about sending a track off to someone on the internet and just get inside what they're trying to achieve when their listeners hear it. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. And yeah, so I, I, I don't really ask for charts. I don't really ask for sheet music. It's more references vibe intention goals and that kind of thing it's so great to hear you use the word vibe because that is that's kind of how i live off in music it's like if it's yeah. sitting right and it's vibing right it's like when people ask me how do i know when a mix is done well if i could sit back in the chair and just vibe off it right <laughs> then i'm like yeah, yeah we're good <laughs> so that, yeah. that's kind of great uh, to, to, you know to hear that from you um from yourself so if we look at like the recording side of it then are you uh using two mics, one mics? How, how are you going about that? So I want to do more experimentation with this, but I am right now exclusively using one microphone, essentially in one position, um, which is, is an area that I have a lot of room to change. And I would be curious to experiment with this more over time. But this microphone that I mentioned, um, it does so many interesting things that I've found the the room for experimentation just within this is really exciting and engaging and always gets the results I'm looking for. Am I right in um, saying as well, that microphone that you're using to record the cello on, is that you can change what mic yeah. that you're recording even so, though... This is for, where it gets for, interested. <laughs> for those of you that aren't familiar with this microphone, um, I'm going to blow your mind a little bit. <laughs> um, so it is a dual capsule microphone. It has a five pin XLR cable splitting out into two three pin XLRs. Everything goes in as a stereo track, but tracking front and back. From there, I set the polar pattern in the box after recording um, because it essentially records everything in Omni, but they have referenced these lockers of mics so accurately that they can carve away parts of the polar pattern um, in post, which hurts my brain. That's Don't genius. ask me to explain it more than I just did because I, I do not understand this witchcraft, but it works. So what I can mic change... do you tend to go for then? <laughs> so my default, uh, I, think, I think I've actually got it pulled up right here. That's crazy. It's mad yeah, so, technology. It's when, when you say that, you're like, it's like we're going into the future. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. So that, that that's what I felt the first time I used this. So I am tracking, actually, my voice. Um, if I felt like it, I could change it in post, but I'll, I'll probably keep it here because I like this sound. I've got an um, Elam 251 in oh, Cardio. My, my favorite um, mic. <laughs> it's beautiful. But the thing is, I've been able to, like, scroll back and forth but i've got like four different u87s in here there's a 47 there's um like literally everything like there's a sony 800g uh there's like ribbon mics that sound fantastic so usually i will start working i have a few different presets that i like with like um like different saturators and like console strips and this plugin um 
the all, all of this emulation happens in the plugin. Um, but I'll have different presets. Amazing. I'm like, I want a low warm sound. So I use like the, the um, what is it, the Royer, uh, no, the f- yeah, the 40, ribbon 48, mic. oh, Coles. Oh, uh, Coles, oh, Coles, yeah. Kind of the black triangular They're great. one. Yeah, Very expensive so, microphones. <laughs> yeah, but like this emulates it beautifully, which yeah. is weird for a large diaphragm condenser. Like I don't, again, I don't know what they're doing, but so I'll be able to change the mic model, polar pattern, positioning, angle of attack after the fact. Um, That's amazing. And it em- emulates all that beautifully. That so, must have saved you as well. You know, like when you've recorded and you want to like have a different sound, you're like, oh, I wish I recorded it like that. Oh no, it doesn't matter. I'm using this the mic. Thing. <laughs> yeah, it's like if a take I get felt different than what I had in my head, but again, coming back to that word vibe, if the vibe worked, I can then change where it's placed in the like mix in air quotes because I'm not even like mixing. It's just doing recording engineer in engineering in post. Um, I love that. <laughs> but like, so I can place everything where I want it in the in the room um, with microphones, polar pattern, with the placement all through this, essentially in the same position in the same room. Amazing. Um, so where, where do you place that mic then when you're recording? So I've found that I love the sound of it about three feet away from my cello. Um, slightly on the treble side of the instrument, which as the player, that's my left side. As a recording engineer looking at the cello, that would be your right. Um, okay. So kind of between the F hole and the bridge, I found that that gets like nice projection tone and warmth and like clarity. It also gets some like fun, scratchy bow, bow noise. Um, and again, that's all taste, but that's like, that's kind of the thing I'm going for. Do you and find then, that you keep that position, so three three feet away? Um, do you find that you kind of keep that with every dub that you do within the production, or do you change that from production to production? Or I, th- there have been times where I've so, so yes, basically I do that for nearly every production. There yeah. are times where I get through roughing out a mix, and I'm just like something's not feeling right, um, and. I realize that I need to just play harder for that song. And so I'll I'll bump the mic back like a foot, foot and a half. And it changes the way I approach the instrument um, by the time the sound is hitting the microphone Um, and things like that. But it's it's minor adjustments and it's occasional. But fantastic. Yeah. For the most part, it's that close mic in this really dry room. That's the thing I always say. It's like just set it and forget it. It's that kind of thing. If, if it sounds good, like, and you like the sound of it and you know, and you're confident that it's going to work on the recording, then yeah. I guess you might as well just leave it. <laughs> the, the more I can take out technical second guessing from my process, the happier I am. So I, I feel like your it's, focus is all on the record. Uh, the focus is on the, the playing then, isn't it? The arranging of. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know. Because like my, my, my process is like all about sitting down and feeling like I just want to feel the song and I want to know that the technical aspects are as taken care of as they can be ahead of time so that I can have the emotional space to sit there and go deep with the song yeah so when you I mean again this will be like on a on a track by track basis but let's say you've set the mic position and you you can you know you're now going to arrange the strings for the track yeah. that you've you've been given what is your like go-to thing i mean let, let's just say you've had a conversation and the conversation's been you know just do your thing yeah you know you say you will go by your vibe so what you know for any of the producers or mixers listening on arranging strings what is your go-to thing to do in the, in that kind of process that's like a really big open question it's, there. It's but... a big que- it's a yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I like it though. Um I will say I already shared my Melodyne secret. You know I'm not <laughs> we got that one in the first secrets. 10 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> I'm my skeletons have been aired. I'm sure there's more, but we'll get there. Um that's that question is really interesting because that part of it for me is one of the most intangible like I started 
playing cello when I was 10 years old because I heard it when I was nine and it like broke something in me. And I was like, yeah. that sound is beautiful. And I like came up like playing in youth symphony and playing in orchestra, studying classical music, and then like moved through Celtic folk, bluegrass, like did the singer songwriter thing. Like I feel strings on such a deep level. Like it's been, it, it was how I was able to express myself before I knew really how to express myself in words. So when I say I want to get the technical part out of the way so I can sit down and just feel it, my go-to thing is really 90% of it's emotional and trusting my ear. Um, because when I hear string parts that I don't like, I know it. And I will, my girlfriend can attest to this, I'll just like turn down the radio while we're listening. And I'm like, these strings are garbage. Like they should have done this, this, this. Like there's so much left on the table. You hear first, first, uh, the first chorus, second chorus, they copy pasted. I'm so mad. Like <laughs> I'm that person and she's exhausted by it. Um, but like, so when I sit down, really what I do is I just listen until I feel something. Yeah. And then hit, hit record. I go back and hit record and just try something. It's a completely experimental process for me. And I don't care how long it takes, how many times I have to re-record. Um, it's gotten quicker as I do this more and more. Yeah. But like, it's experimentation. I'll lay down one part that just kind of came to me. I'll try it. I'll double it. And then I'll be like, oh, I'm hearing this or this part needs to move here. Or like, oh, they said dance and they, there's a gap between the lyrics. How do I dance there? Like, yeah. So I it's like the least technical and theory. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I see where you're coming from. Though, yeah. With it. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's how you know you're a great player. <laughs> it's also how I know I'm kind of full of it because like I, <laughs> I honestly can't tell you what I do every time I step away from a session and listen to what I did I was like how did that happen like I don't remember 90% of that <laughs> do, do you find that when you're recording it then are you doing multiple takes and then like I would do with a vocal recording if I'm recording a vocalist I'll do multiple takes of let's say verse one and then I'll go through and I'll comp in between each take for verse one. Do you do the same thing with uh, string arranging? Is that yeah, so a similar th kind of there process? are times where I do that. Um, but I found that the comping process for me is it takes me out of feel enough right. that I start getting I start questioning myself a lot. Um because like I'll sit down and I'll do 15 takes, but I've learned to not like in studio one, the DAW I'm using, like I, I do takes to layers. So I hit record, do a bunch of takes. And like, when you stop, it just like, boom, all the like takes hit at once and you can start comping. Yeah. That's like a really overwhelming moment for me. Cause I'm like, now I have to go listen to all that, but I know that 90% of it wasn't good. So what I've started doing more is just recording and moving on. And then listening to the full arrangement and listening for mistakes. And if it's an isolated section that has clear moments that I can punch in and out, I'll do, I'll do punch-ins. Um, yeah. But usually yeah. I'll like experiment and track the whole thing, drag, highlight every clip, turn them red. So I know what's like trash <laughs> and then I'll go through and I will re-record everything. Wow, because you're going to a lot of detail then. A I, lot. Last week I did a project where I went through that like probably four or five times. Um, because well, we like, all know if anybody ever needs strings that is listening to this podcast, <laughs> he's your guy because you know that you're going to get some good quality strings coming back. <laughs> like, I'm just, I, I know, I mean, what you were saying, it's like, you, you know, when a mix is done, when you can sit back in the chair and vibe with it. Like yeah. when I get, all of my ideas out into the session, I sit back and listen. And if there's a moment where like, I don't know, my guy, my gut kind of twists or like, I'm like, I, that's not my best work. Yeah. Like I'll flag it. Like I'll just, I'll drop a marker and try to figure out what's wrong. Um, 
and so, so you're often going to a lot of detail getting it kind of perfect and that kind of brings me on to then saying you, you know you've let out your first secret of melodyne, m- melodyne. <laughs> <laughs> do you cut and time or quantize any of your mm. takes you know what sometimes um i Is that will another secret out <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> I feel like the actual secret part, I know I should say it because I had a moment where I'm like, do I say this? Do I admit this here? <laughs> um, I don't often do that because I'm really bad at it. Like, um, I haven't figured out how to wrangle quantization parameters in Studio One super effectively yet. Like, it does screwy things with my parts when I've tried. But that um, can be a very good thing that you don't know how to do it because it means yeah. it kind of stops you. I mean, that's, doing it. <laughs> that's the thing. Like, so I haven't, I haven't really gone in and learned because I'm like, that's a dangerous road to follow. <laughs> like I'm already, I'm already pulling out Melodyne. Like, do I really need to be pulling out like quantization stuff? Like this feels like a dangerous place, but what I will do, um, especially in rhythmic parts, again, where the yep. vibe is right, but like I'll hear like a good example. It's like, I, I'll track, um, like for the final chorus, sometimes when things like really swell and you want a different feel, I'll have like a, a low cello part go from like a legato into like a staccato thing to kind of give like a pulse underneath yeah. the arrangement. Um, and there are times when I'm tracking that right left where like I'll like slightly miss time one of the beats or like I'll, I'll rush something and you feel it, especially when you're listening on headphones, like your head kind of starts twisting when one part gets ahead. And so yeah. I'll just like cut and like kind of manually try to retime a little bit um, if it's close. And I don't That's wanna... amazing that you've said manually because I'm a bit like that. Like I get a bit worried when things are like automatic, you know, like when, you know, although as you've mentioned with your microphone, it is very kind of an automatic kind of into the future yeah. kind of thing with timing a musician using something automatic i'm not going to sit here and say i don't because i do time things automatically totally. sometimes but by doing it manually you're never going to beat it yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like the most geeky thing to say but it's like if it takes you four hours it takes you four hours like just manually do it and so i think it's actually a positive that you uh, don't know how to use the uh quantize <laughs> function because <laughs> you're doing it the proper way I will stay ignorant for the rest of my days. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> so you mentioned that you, you that you're recording left and right. Uh, is yeah. that something that you're doing every take? And are you doing that for the stereo field? For the producer or mixer to have everything in stereo? Like what is the reason for that? Yeah, so I when I started doing this, this has all been a very experimental process with me. Cause like I said, I would just like hear string arrangements and like want to scream. And it got to the <laughs> point where I was like, all right, stop just saying it, do something about it. Like, yeah, I don't know, Harley, if you think you're like, if you're so much better, like prove it. And so I started like trying. And at first it was like, Oh no, I'm terrible at this, which like obviously with anything new you try. Um, but I started finding that, I, I would track things and try to figure out how to pan them. And I would be like, this is missing something. It needs more thickness. I'm like, what's another part I can add? And I realized that just so much of the time, what I was looking for was that thickness of having something doubled. Um, yeah. And it, one of my favorite things about it is it just pushes it farther back in on the sonic stage. Um, because like you've got two of them, you don't hear the bow change on one, you hear the synchronization. Like you don't hear like that was a big shift or that was a big slide. It's like, oh, there's a movement happening back there. Um, yeah. And That's like quite, the more yeah, the more the more layers you add, like the lower in the mix each layer is. So the less attention it draws to itself. So I found that doubling is a really like happy medium for me. I I love it as well when I get doubles of it of everything i think it's it's great but it's interesting you say about doing the, a full left and right because for example if i think of it like an orchestra the cello would be onto the right yeah so yeah. i it's this thing where it's like okay so you're going to have it in stereo so you left and right but the cello should kind of be on the right you, it should feel on the right so i kind of do one 100 right and then in pro tools on the other one i kind of do it 
like a third, not over half, but just like a yeah. third up. So it's kind of tilted to the right to give it that kind of live feel. Yeah. Do you do any of that kind of stuff when you're sending it to people or do you just keep it kind of left and right? That's it. And you don't do any panning at all or? I I hard pan left, right on the tracks that I send yeah. um, for about 90% of them. For other stuff, if it's not like clean doubles, I don't do that. Yeah. Like for for lead part, sometimes I'll I have a pop producer, like really dear friend of mine who I've worked with a couple of times now. She's incredible. Yeah. But uh her note is always like, Can you just do a crazy ad lib track? And I'm like <laughs> Love that. <laughs> okay. So I'm like the diva in the vocal booth. I love this. <laughs> um but like for things like that, for lead lines, for counter melodies and stuff, I'll leave those panned fairly center. Um, sometimes like maybe 20 to 30 off to one side, depending on where, where the stereo field in the mix that I get is, um, like if someone has a melody and I like kind of want some sort of response line or something at the end that's soaring a little bit, like right down the middle kind of competes sometimes. So I'll like bump it out to the side a bit, but yeah, usually it's stuff that's centered or hard panned to be that's honest. great i mean then you're giving whoever it's going on to next the kind of power to to do what they yeah. want so that's that's really good so you know a lot of producers today we have native instruments contact we've got all these libraries with uh, yeah. strings and um you know what is your thoughts on using program strings vs real strings and do you find that you do both if you know if i was to come to you for a, you know string arranging um would you only give me real strings or would you also give me program and give me a blend or, or kind of what is your view on that yeah it's a, the, I, I love that question um so i think virtual instruments are amazing like there are times where i listen to a track and i'll dm the producer and say dude those strings are amazing who did that he's like that's that's virtual i'm like oh <laughs> I need to find a new job. Okay. Um, but like the, the the quality of that is getting so good. And I'm actually talking to someone right now about building a contact library um, for uh, like of my cello because I'm super interested in that world. Um, yeah. Just like some, I don't know, that that's a that's a whole other conversation. But like the, it, I'm fascinated by the idea of thickening things with libraries. It's not something I'm well versed in yet, but actually the job I just did last week, I was hearing, he sent me a rough string arrangement of like what he was hearing and said, take this, do what you want. Um, And he basically, he did it with something that was really Mellotron sounding. And I just fell in love with that Mellotron sound on that track and just felt right. So I pulled some of the lines I recorded and like added a I like literally with the the melodyne um just dragged that it turns it into midi and I layered some mellotron into what I did and I was like, "Oh my god, that did it." Like that's what wow. that song needed. So, I'm super curious to try doing that. I have some like really beautiful violin and viola VSTs um, that I'm I'm really curious. I'm hoping in the next couple of weeks to try that. But right now, pretty much everything I'm sending is live tracked, whether it's cello, which is my main instrument, or like I am an absolute monster and I hold a violin like a cello between my knees, <laughs> tuck the scroll <laughs> under my chin and pretend I can play it. Um, just when something needs that like top end uh, or yeah. a little extra motion or something. But yeah, I'm I'm pretty much sticking to the live stuff at the moment. That I mean, I love the live stuff. I mean, one thing that I've noticed, and, it, and it's great that, you know, you're so into the kind of the string arranging side of it as well, is because anybody can buy uh, virtual strings, but it's understanding how those strings work, harmony aspect of it. Yeah. It's all those things that, that unless you if you don't know how to do that the virtual strings are not going to be great and and i feel like having live strings you get that knowledge that that's kind of you know i guess what you know the listeners if if you need strings on a track and you were to get a live string player to do it like yourself you know that is what you're paying for you're paying for the knowledge to understand the string arrangement so i, I do think there's a lot of value in still using 
live streams but it's it's great yourself because a lot of people that you know do what you do they'll be like no no i, I don't want program strings i want to do everything r- thing real so it's, it's like a very modern way of uh, you know of doing it which is <laughs> absolutely fantastic <laughs> man i love pop music pan it hard left right i don't know double it we're gonna retune <laughs> stuff like uh here's a mellotron whatever man yeah it sounds good. and uh let, let's copy and paste first chorus to second chorus yeah <laughs> no that that one that is where i draw the line that <laughs> I will come after you. <laughs> so, well, that's that goes on to another question. Then. So, if you don't like it when um, stuff's copied and pasted in, a, in a, a, an arrangement, what is it that you want to see in, let's say, the second chorus that's different from the first chorus in the strings arrangement? Like, what are you looking for? I, I feel like this comes from like studying songwriting. Um, and yeah. m- maybe that's why there are some string players out there and arrangers that don't feel as strongly about this, at least yeah. from the work, the work I hear on the radio, if that's any indication. Yeah. Um, I, I want a song to take me somewhere. When the song starts, you set the rules of the world I'm entering. You start somewhere. And we're going to end up somewhere that's different than where we started somehow. Like, I think we can all pretty much agree that these are the rules. Like, yep. except for like, I don't know, like dance, instrumental stuff. But even then, like the, the journey is the person. Anyway. Always has to be a <laughs> so, build up. <laughs> yeah. So I want to go from point A to point Z. And stuff needs to happen in the middle. And if the string arrangement is not supporting that, I think it's taking away like, yeah, those string pads like are a nice layer, but if it's like just repeating, there's like so much lost opportunity, I think. So what I'm looking for from like first chorus to second chorus, it changes with every song, but I'm looking for that to be a part of the journey that I'm being taken on as the listener. Um, yeah. So often the way that manifests is, um, changing inversions adding more movement sometimes i'll take like the middle lines um and and this ties into both inversions and movement but like i'll i'll do like shifts halfway through the chord to change the way the middle of the chord feels and just like add something that pushes you forward that unless you're really listening you're like i don't know what that was but i felt something um, yeah, yeah. So I don't want it to be ostentatious, um, but it it needs to move. It needs to develop. Like if I hear the same thing twice, I'm like, really? You couldn't think of one more thing? <laughs> like <laughs> laziness. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. It. I wonder sometimes. Um, I don't want to yeah. come after anyone, but like th- those are those are my feelings about it. I I just really. I feel strongly about serving the song. That is such a great thing to say because I think as a anybody that that wants to have strings on their track, that is what they're going to hope that the string player is going to be feeling. <laughs> you know, totally. they're going to want you to really feel the song and understand where it needs to go for it to be the best it can be. So yeah, it's like I I have a microphone, I know how to play the cello, but like I'm getting hired to make your song better. Like, yeah. I take that seriously. Like the cello is a tool that I use to make your song do something to the person that you want to be listening to it. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. So do you do any kind of, so you engineer your strings, obviously, you you know, you play the strings, you engineer the strings, um, you know, record it and you send it off. Do you do any kind of EQ, compression, either on the way in or after at all? Um, before you send the strings like do you kind of get the strings to sound how you want them mixed and then hoping that the person that takes them on kind of just adds to it or do you send them completely dry so that's that's been a journey for me um when i was starting i felt like every mixing engineer was more knowledgeable than me and wanted everything totally dry and just like a blank canvas And when I started hearing those mixes back, I realized that there was a level I was hearing something that was different than what the engineer 
understood about what I had created. Um, so I realized that when I was like giving mono tracks center pan totally dry, like it was like this kind of weird sweep across the stereo field and like things like there was some frequency masking and I'm like, oh, that that part that I added in there, I don't think they noticed it. So what I've started doing is, again, the presets that I have, like I have these channel presets that I just load up depending on the sound that I'm going for. And I kind of treat that as a part of the sound that I'm capturing. And I've gotten comfortable leaning into that. Everything I do is gentle. Um, I don't want someone to get something and think, what the hell is going on with this one? I want them to think like, oh, there's like a different tone that sits in this place. Like, I know what this is for. I'm basically trying to convey my vision, but not force anyone's hand. So it's always an experimentation process and I'm, I'm building on it little by little. But right what now, you just essentially... Said there, what you said there is like a dream for a mixer to have because it's like, <laughs> like what you said about when you've had your strings mixed by someone else, their expertise in arranging isn't the same as yours. Like yours wouldn't be yeah. the same in, let's say, EQ compression. And so when you're giving your files over and they're changing the stereo panning of it, which is actually part of the arrangement and of the sound, but they're changing it, although they might have EQ'd it properly and compressed it properly, it's not exactly the view of whoever played it. It wasn't. And, and that's funny. When, when, you know, whenever I'm mixing, I always try and do what people meant to do, but enhance it. Yeah. And totally. kind of what you've said there is what happens a lot. It shouldn't happen, but it does happen a lot. It's because, you know, you can't be the best at everything. Yeah. You know, so if you get given that job to be suddenly mixing the strings, but also arranging the strings within the song, it can go wrong. So that's, yeah. that's, that's great that you said that. So, uh, you know, for anybody listening, that's really important stuff to take away that, that you've got to think about what did the person record it want when they recorded it not what sounds good just to the to you you know yeah it's uh it's well, great and <laughs> it's interesting because the way i found uh, how i found my way to that place was i realized that i was sending tracks off and i was always nervous about how the mixing engineer would perceive them because to me at that point mixing was kind of this arcane thing and i'm like i don't totally know what they need so I went to a mixing engineer friend of mine, like the the engineer, one of the engineers I respect the most in the world, and asked him, like, I, I sent him, like, files that I was sending to a client. I'm like, what would you say if you got these? Like, what do you think? Where are my weak points? How can I improve, like, file naming, like, folder structure, everything? And he just, like, sat me down and ripped it apart. And he was like, I would be happy as an engineer if I got this. And I just, I rebuilt my whole like export and delivery workflow around that. Because I'm like, at the end of the day, like my client is usually an artist or producer. Like they'll drop something into the session. Like they'll take a, like the whole wet bus and just be like, okay, cool. That is where it needs to be. I'll send this to the engineer later. I want the engineer to just drop like my files in their session and have my vision there, but with total control and able to take it farther. Like it's going to make them look better. Everything you're saying is like incredible because it's like <laughs> I spend my life renaming files from either artists or producers because they send me audio one, audio two, and really it's a kick and a snare. <laughs> you know and it it wastes a lot of time and and sometimes you, like what you said you you give strings over and i've had it before and i'm like i don't know what is the cello i don't know what the violin i mean you know, yeah. with experience you can kind of hear it but if but you can't assume that you can't assume that everybody is going to know where everything is and so it's amazing to hear you know yourself you know recording it because it's like you you you'd be a dream to work with <laughs> if that makes <laughs> sense because i could literally just drag and drop everything and i'll know exactly where you're going with it and i'll know exactly your vision and then my job is to bring that vision to life and that's exactly what i want 
from a string arranger, string, you know, someone that's recording their strings. So everybody that's listening, please take that <laughs> on board massively. <laughs> and it's yeah, I mean, great like, that you've wanted to learn that as well, because file management, workflow, labeling, it's the number one time waster if yeah. not done properly. So <laughs> Yeah. I mean like the I, the last thing I want is to get in front of someone I admire to have my files show up on their desktop for them to load it up and think, God, this guy sucks before they even hear my work. Yeah. So it's like, it's a self-preservation thing as much as anything. Like I want to, my first impression to be good. Like I want that person next time they think I need strings. I want them to think of me. But like, that's a great way of looking at it because you, you automatically in a way, you know, you shouldn't judge a book by its cover. But at the same time, if you are handed strings with audio one, audio two, audio three, it just yeah. comes across as one, they don't know what they're doing. Two, they've yeah. been lazy. Three, like they're just not bothered. And it just looks unprofessional. Whereas yeah. when I get it kind of cello one left, cello one right, cello two harmony left, or, you know, when it's like that, you're like, ah, this person knows what they're doing. Yep. So you have that confidence straight away. So great business side as well. You know, that's touching on how to deliver files. Um, but everything kind of evolves around the same thing. And it's it's just about knowing what you're doing and being professional with every stage of the of the development of the of the track. Um so yeah. yes, that's yeah, that's like it's blown my mind some of the stuff you're saying because it's what I think <laughs> about day to day, and I'm like, you're basically telling me my feelings. <laughs> just trying just trying to get people to not hate me man <laughs> <laughs> so that kind of goes on to you know me saying that so you you talked about you know your strings getting mixed by uh, you know other people and and that and so more often than not you know you don't have to say names but more often than not do you find that when you send stuff to mixes it comes back exactly how you wanted it or does it like come back absolutely horrendous and you're like what is going on i'm not putting my name to this yeah so it that's I, I love I love that because that's been interesting to watch over time. It obviously depends on the engineer. Like, yeah, I can generally tell based on the rough mix and the conversation what the end product is going to sound like. Like the care you put into the beginning of the process reflects yeah. the quality of what you're going to get at the end. Um, yeah, like and that's just the case with like any any of this any working in audio um there are times where and i honestly love it when this happens like i i had an engineer the other day tell me like i didn't even use the multi-tracks like i pulled up the rough mix you sent and like kind of sculpted the isolated reverb send and it was like perfect and like i love hearing that and so essentially my vision made it onto the track which is cool there was also a track that's coming out. I think it's coming out this Friday. Oh, so probably around when this episode's coming out, October 14th. Um, yeah. I, the artist just sent me the track like a week ago. And I just like had to sit down. The mix is so good. Like it's wow. so good. I listened nice when and happens. I was like, <laughs> who's playing cello? And I was like, oh, damn, that's that's my work. How did he get it to sound like that? So I again, I just sent a message to the engineer. I was like, dude, what did you do? Um, and it, so it was what one do of those. I, he, <laughs> More secrets. I mean, on, he's one of those <laughs> guys. He he didn't even remember. He's like, I think I just like bust it to a tape machine. I was like, oh, okay, that makes sense. <laughs> Add a bit um, of analog warmth. Can't go wrong. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like just smashed it all onto tape and then back into the DAW. Um, but that is actually a great compliment that he said that because I always find, right, if things are recorded properly by someone that knows what they're doing, knows how to do mic placement, which you've done because you're, you've are you experimented, you find that you don't actually need to do much to the audio for it to sound good. Like over compressed strings just sound horrible to me. I want yeah. dynamics. I want that live feel. And so yeah. if you record your strings with the live feel and you record it properly, all I'm going to have to do is some sculpting to fit it into the track, but yeah. I don't need to actually change the sound of the strings. And I think that that is, so for yourself, that is a great compliment to have a mix engineer go, I didn't do anything. I just put some tape on it kind of thing. Cause it just means that you've, you've done an amazing job, you know, it's, it's good. Really I, good. I enjoy what I do, but like, yeah, getting, getting a mix back like that, 
like hearing, I don't know, that creative mix. I was like, this song, this sounds like a different song and I'm inside yeah. it now. Like, so I, I love, I love it when people take things in a direction I didn't expect. So what do you do when it comes back awful? <laughs> it like, it, it is what it is. Yeah. I say like, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't want to get into too many specifics in case someone's, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, like, you, you know, I, I won't put you on the spot. I promise. <laughs> No, it's like, <laughs> but I guess you just you know have to feeling, just accept like, it. But do you ever yeah. give them like your feelings towards it? Are you ever like, totally. no, I think it should be like this, you know? Yeah, like I'll I'll sometimes ask who people worked with. I'll make suggestions. I usually try to ask questions more than anything. Um, yeah. Like, is is this the final mix? Like, how how do you feel about this? I don't know. My mom's a therapist. <laughs> I, love, I love those questions. Like. Like, and my mom's a therapist, so I feel like I got, I, I grew up with a lot of those leading questions, but like, I don't know, like, I, I really, I, I really care about everything that I work on and yeah. I want the thing that my client releases to live up to their hopes for it. And if yeah. it does, amazing. And I'm grateful to have played a part in it, even if it doesn't live up to my expectations and where I feel like I am going. Um, yeah. Their end product is irrelevant to that. For me, that's their journey. And they were gracious enough to include me in that. So that's a great way to view it. That's a, I'm you know, not a positive here way to, to judge view it as well. the end product. Yeah. Like, yeah. Right. When you're doing so many projects week in, week out, like yourself, you, you know, you, you've got to just i guess enjoy the process haven't you and you know you can't always be like oh i want it like this i want it like that because you know <laughs> too <Yeah>. busy <laughs> yeah yeah so um talking a little bit about actually the, the mix inside do you send with reverb on or without reverb and because obviously reverb and strings is a massive topic it's... and delays i mean i i with strings I, I don't really unless it's like a staccato kind of thing i might add a delay but with a lot of the sustained stuff, it's no delay, just some reverb. It depends. It depends. But what's your kind of view on that? And are you like always wanting specific reverbs on strings? And you know, it will depend, of course. But. Yeah. So I, I actually, I might go edit my template after this and add a, a delay in there uh, <laughs> to try on some staccato stuff that I'm recording right now. I'm like, uh, I've never thought of that. That's such a. That's good my idea. little trick. A, a little eight oh. note delay filtered. Underneath oh my some God. staccato strings, it kind of adds a bit of movement. <laughs> you just blew my mind. I'm so excited to try that. I'm literally going to try that today. Okay. Anyway, I, <laughs> I don't have more to say about that because I'm just, I'm processing that as we speak. For all the but, listeners um, that, that, aren't, that aren't watching the video, when I said that, I saw your reaction and I was like, I'm going to say something really bad. <laughs> no. Oh, dude. No, I just got so excited. I'm already like, which delay plugin do I want to use for that? But, bit of Echo um, Boy. <laughs> actually, yeah, you're right. Um, but so for reverb, I have, yeah. again, like the mixing engineer friend that I went to and asked for his feedback on like process and delivery. Um, he listened to my stuff. He's like, you need a better reverb plugin. Um, and before that, I hadn't really thought much about it because to me at that point, reverb, I had a reverb send and I would roughly dial how much reverb I wanted to send on each track. And I treated that as something that I listened to and then went on the rough mix that I would send basically to say like, here's what I have. Let's have a conversation and see where this is for you before I sent multi-tracks. Um, I've started changing my process a little bit from that, but he basically said, if you send a, an, a, a, if you deliver a reverb send and it's the right feel, like it'll get used in the final mix, which just had not occurred to me before. So I got really serious about finding the right reverb. Um, and he turned me on to Liquid Sonics, the Reverberate 3. Seventh Heaven, my favorite. Oh, yeah. See, I think I he also told me to download all of the B Bricasti. Bricasti's um, the best. <laughs> so I, I loaded all of the Bricasti emulations. Is that what you're using? Is that you using um, Liquid Sonics 7? Amazing. Yeah, so I'm using the Reverberate 3. 
but with yeah, some of the seven heaven like, yeah, yeah. algorithms, essentially. Yeah, yeah. Um, my favorite preset, honestly, is Dark Hall. Um, that's in the Reverberate 3 preset list, and it just fits the vibe like 80% of the time. Do you I've leave got the f- same kind of reverb time decay and all that? Is that just does that stay the same? You just on every you just put it on there and you send that as a reverb send. Is that kind of how you pretty much? Yeah. Um, I don't know enough about the inner workings of reverbs, and I haven't really gone in and done a ton of experimentation to find to to basically tune my ear to being comfortable with like getting those fine tunings done. I can tell when it doesn't fit the vision. And I'll go hunting until yeah. it does. Experiment, um, I guess, and just find yeah. out what, what again, so, it goes back to the vibe, doesn't it? What feels right. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So I, I have that isolated reverb send basically to place the strings as I'm tracking where I want them. Because if I'm running it dry, I'm going to hate every note of everything I play. Um, so you record within wet within the headphones as well. So yeah. you can feel like you're in a space. And yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Um. Yeah, things never feel right to me until I've got like four or five tracks down and I start yeah. getting that cumulative effect and I start feeling the space. Yeah. So like the first thing I do is just like get anything in so this kind of activate the space. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I'll That's I'll amazing. like as it's coming together, sometimes the reverb stops feeling right and I'll go hunting for something that fits the rough mix that I have better. Um but yeah, when I when I nice. bounce it, I bounce um a wet bus so all the cellos with reverb um as a file i bounce all of the multi tracks just with like a couple of like a little bit of saturation just like this microphone with the model i want and just like a, a touch of warmth to place it where i want um give it that presence those are dry but if you load up all of the multi tracks and the reverb send it's exactly what i was hearing in my headphones um again that's a can... dream come true to have <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i i just i i realized that so much of my vision of something was how it sounded in that space and where it was pushed to because i listened to a few of my projects with no reverb and i was like it's so quiet it sounds kind of scratchy like it's weird like they're gonna have to hear that and go hunting for their reverb to figure out what i even intended so I treat the reverb send as essentially a reference for the engineer so they can hear it and go, okay, that's where I want it. I don't like the decay time or that's a little weird. I'm going to swap it out for this, but yeah. like roughly knowing where to place it. And even like what I've been hearing from people is they're like, yeah, I just, I EQ'd the reverb send to get it to fit. Um, yeah, I do. Yeah. It, lots of EQ, bottom end in reverb isn't great. Mud, yeah. you know muddies up the mix a lot especially when it comes yeah. down to like low stuff like cello yeah if that a big reverb needs to be controlled yeah <laughs> but no that's absolutely fantastic to uh, to hear all these things and uh you know thank you so much for coming on and uh i have one last question and i ask this to to everybody that comes on and i always say what three things would you give your you know if you were starting out now so to any of the listeners that are starting out what three things you that you know now that you wish you knew back then whoa so that that's actually interesting and i'm gonna ask for a little more context (laughs) yeah i'm gonna ask for a little more context (laughs) starting what phase because for me it's been like my brain is like i don't know 10 years old or like 25 so um when you started working professionally with clients doing string arrangements yeah. and recordings. Okay. So the first thing is I, I wish I had trusted myself more, um, which that, that comes with time and experience. But I realized there were so many times where I would retract something that was working or I would send something off and be afraid of what the feedback I was going to get was. Um, and I realized that literally the worst thing that can happen is someone will say, this isn't working. And then I can say, how, and what can we do? Like, yeah, that's the worst thing. Like, so I, I, I wish I had trusted myself more and been a little, had a little more comfort in it. Um, 
I probably didn't need to spend quite as much time thinking about gear as I did. Um, I went through that phase as well. We all yeah. do, don't we? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like realizing, like I am in probably a 10 foot by 12 foot room in an apartment, drywall, big window, literally all of the things you hear, like don't do, especially for strings. And I have never been happier with the sound I'm getting. Like, it's awesome. That's so great like, to hear. Just shows it's, it's not about the room, not about it's, it's about you. Obviously, yeah. those things can help, but it's about you at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like this microphone was $1,500. It was a lot to spend. But like, honestly, if I was going to buy another microphone tomorrow, it would be another one of these. Like, I don't need more than that. And like, same with the interface, same with the computer. It's like, no, I've got, I've got what I need. I just have to work at this. Um, trying to think about a third thing. I feel th these are very esoteric, aren't they? <laughs> I'm going to a very emotional place with it's this. It's great. It's great. Hmm. You know, I, I know the impact that this will have on the listeners listening to that, because I remember as a young, you know, being a lot younger than, well, you know, back then, I would yeah. always be like, oh, to get this a sound, I need this bit. I need this bit of gear and realize, no, it's not that. It's me. I need to develop my skills more. I need to experience more. And those two points you've just said yeah. is exactly right. And, you know, actually, I feel like that touches on a third thing. Um, okay. <laughs> the third thing is you can't do it alone. I, I learned a lot of the basics of this in a phase where I was like, I'm going to write a song, record it produce it mix it maybe i'll hire a mastering engineer because you know someone else should be involved and polish it and looking back on that i'm like what the hell was i thinking like i started narrowing down more and more until now i'm the guy that records strings on your song that's about 75 percent to 90 percent done like that's so specific and if I had realized that that was where I was going when I got serious about doing this professionally, I would have felt constricted. But now getting here, it's like so liberating because I'm getting handed these amazing songs. I'm getting to meet these wonderful people. Like there's some really exciting projects that I'm working on that I thought were going to be out of my league for the next like five to 10 years. And because I got specific and focused on building community, um, I, I feel very liberated in my work. That's amazing. And ironically, I'm getting to like write again and I'm working with a producer, a couple producers who I met doing this on like my original stuff because they heard it and they were like, oh, we should work on this. And it was an accident. So getting specific really felt liberating. That's fantastic to hear. I mean, uh, all of that stuff is just incredible and it's yeah i have no words it's it's really it's, you know it's it's great to hear that from people like yourself you know you you've gone from doing it uh you know as a as a kid to now doing it full time being successful at it doing great things it's it's amazing and it's an absolute pleasure to uh have you on the uh podcast i know that the listeners are going to really enjoy this uh episode so thank you very oh. much Thank you. It's been such a joy getting to like nerd out about this stuff. <laughs> Thank you. And, and, and again, to all the listeners that are listening, if you ever need any strings or any arranging in your productions or any advice, head over to Harley. I'll be linking all of his social media stuff um, in the podcast description as well. So uh, you'll be able to contact. And if you want to shout out what your uh, Instagram is so people can contact you, Harley, that'd be great. Yeah, my Instagram is at Harley Eblen, H-A-R-L-E-Y-E-B-L-E-N. If you send me a DM there, like, I'll answer. I'm, I like, you can probably tell that I get really excited talking about this stuff. Um, always down to answer questions and just like have a conversation about screens. Fantastic. Well, Harley, thank you so much for your time. And uh, we'll have to get you back on for another one. Yeah, I'm in. <laughs>